We all, all of us in medicine who are dealing with patients notice that there are some patients who are so sensitive to carbohydrates that you can't get rid of their diabetes until they get off all fruit, let alone sugar. I mean, they shouldn't be eating sugar at all. They shouldn't be eating any refined grains. But if they eat any grains, even whole grains and fruit, they have trouble. And those people are what we would call more of a protein type, and they really need to be on a very, very low carbohydrate diet. That's why, you know, I don't advocate the At Atkins diet per se, but that's why it works for so many people. Probably 60% of our population, or at least 30 or 40%, are protein types and they don't do well on lots of carbs. So even though the types of protein that, that he advocated sometimes were not healthy, the fact that he had people avoid carbs actually worked for a lot of people to lose weight. Yes? Vitamin D. Yes. Vitamin D3. Yes. Yes, vitamin D3 is the vitamin D. The, the question was, is there a difference between vitamin D in general and vitamin D3? Vitamin D3 is the vitamin that you want to look for. It's the one that's made naturally by the skin in presence of sunlight, and it's the one uh, found in supplements that's the most assimilable in the body. Vitamin D D2 will also be assimilated, but not as easily and as well. Vitamin D3 is the natural vitamin D. Yes? There's so many people getting thyroid problems. Yes. Including myself. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, let me give your doctor a lesson. This, this is a question in, um, about uh, thyroid problems and iodine. And this lady said, you know, she's been reading about iodine. She's heard that iodine may be important. And the doctor said, no, you get lots of iodine in your bread. Well, your doctor, <laughs> see, I think, the, I think my patient, the, the, the audience here and my patients can answer that question better than your doctor can. The fact is that bread used to be made with iodine. And that's probably one of the reasons that, you know, there wasn't as much hypothyroidism in the past. Uh, there was, I, bread was iodinated. Now it's made with bromine. If you look, look at the periodic chart, there's iodine, bromine, chloride, and fluorine. Those, those four elements are very commonly found in nature. And they actually are so similar that they can fit onto the same molecules in the body. But if you have a lot of bromine in the body, it pushes off the iodine. If you have a lot of chlorine in the body, it pushes off the iodine. And if you have a lot of fluorine in the body, it pushes off the iodine. So fluoridated water, chlorinated water that you're breathing in or you go to a swimming pool, brominated bread and all the baked goods are full of bromine. Is there any wonder why we don't have enough iodine in our bodies? And it's because there's an epidemic of hypothyroidism due to, due to low iodine. We actually measure iodine stores in the person, in people, and you can't do it on a blood test. And the iodine stores are low in almost 95% of my patient population. You have to really take supplementation. You know, the, the, uh, we, we had a solution to this at one time, although this is not the healthiest way to do it. They had iodized salt. But now everybody's been told not to salt their foods because it causes blood pressure. So they stopped salting their foods, and we stopped getting the only source of iodine that most of us have. And there are a few places in the world, like uh, the Midwest and Austria, that are goiter belts, that have so little iodine in the soil that they have epidemics of hypothyroidism. Not use toothpaste that has you, yeah, I would not use toothpaste that has fluoride. I would certainly not use fluoridated water. Um, that's, a, that's a big scam. You know. uh, it's, it's a byproduct of the aluminum industry, fluoride. And um, you know, it was a good place for them to dump their toxic waste, but you don't want them dumping it in your body. Not if the environmentalists who know anything about it that can help it. It's really a, it's really a shame. You know, it's, it's, it's not the best way to avoid cavities. It's really not. If you eat the way I talked about, without the sugar and the, the bologna in the diet, you'll be fine. No cavities. Yeah. Human growth hormone. The question is on human growth hormone. As, as we get older, our growth hormone levels do drop. And it's, it's very controversial replacing human growth hormone. It's the only drug that I know of that the FDA doesn't allow you to, to uh, prescribe it off-label. You know, the FDA actually allows any doctor to prescribe any drug that's been approved for one purpose. You can prescribe it for another purpose, except human growth hormone. So for, for whatever reason, human growth hormone has been sort of labeled as this dangerous product. There's very little evidence that it is dangerous. 
you know, nothing if given in too much, too large amount is, is safe. You know, you can kill somebody by giving them too much water. But human growth hormone probably is safe. Most of the studies show that it can dramatically help um, body composition. It can also dramatically help health. Even in patients who are dying of heart failure, heart disease can sometimes be uh, improved with human growth hormone. There's some fears that it might increase cancer risk, but those are associative. You know, human growth hormone raises IGF-1 levels, and IGF high IGF-1 levels are associated with some forms of cancer. But, in, but it also does other things in the body. It raises another a binding protein, which inactivates IGF-1. So, and based on people's experience who are prescribing it, it doesn't seem to cause cancer. Yes? Yeah, actually, interestingly, you don't lose the production of, you, of human growth hormone as you get older, but you, you, you stop secreting it. So, uh, and you secrete it, the pituitary gland secretes it primarily at night, right around bedtime, right after an hour or two after you go to sleep. The best way to keep your growth hormone levels up, believe it or not, actually the secretion up, is to do heavy exercise, like, uh, like weightlifting, sprinting, and don't eat any sugar at night. The thing that turns off growth hormone production is insulin. And anything that raises your insulin level will shut off your growth hormone production. So if you eat a sweet at night, you know, if you have to have that sweet or something with carbo high carbohydrates, that raises your insulin level and it turns off your nighttime growth hormone production. So you should exercise in the evening? Not necessarily in the evening. Uh, you know, if you exercise in the morning or the afternoon, anytime you exercise, it gives, you can get a burst of growth hormone. But it's got to be intense exercise, not walking. Yes. How? Okay. Okay. Very often, the question is, if your blood test is normal for hypothyroidism, how can you determine that you're actually hyper, hypothyroid? Very often, doctors will use something called TSH as a screening test. This TSH is not a good screening test. You know, before TSH was, before some of these blood tests were around. Doctors had this very strange habit of trying to actually ask patients questions. It was really strange. I mean, the old days of medicine, I don't know what they were doing, but they actually talked to a patient and said, well, what do you feel? Do you, uh, do you feel sluggish? Do you feel fatigued? Have you gained weight? Have you have trouble losing weight? Have your hair been falling out? Have your eyebrows been getting thin? Have your skin been getting dry? Are you susceptible to infections? Are you constipated? Are you cold all the time? They would ask questions. And when people, people would answer, they'd say, okay, well, you're hypothyroid. You're going to need thyroid hormone. Now we have a TSH, and you can ask people the same questions. The TSH can be completely normal, and the doctor will say, uh, well, your TSH is normal. You couldn't be hypothyroid. So the patient walks out feeling miserable. So TSH is not a great screening test. That's number one. It's a total fallacy that it's being used effectively as a screening test. If you have high cortisol levels, your TSH will not respond to low thyroid. If you have thyroid antibodies, your TSH will not respond to low thyroid. So you treat the patient, not the lab test. That's the most important thing. And you have to look at other, all the other thyroid hormones, free T4, free T3, thyroid antibodies, to really make a good determination about thyroid hormone. To, you know, but the most important thing is clinical picture. And Synthroid very often doesn't work. Synthroid is T4, synthetic T4, which if you have trouble converting T4 to T3, you'll be absolutely miserable, you'll stay hypothyroid clinically, and yet your blood tests will be happy, your doctor will be happy, but you'll be miserable. <laughs>